Um, all right, I'm really looking forward to uh, the talk of uh, Dr. Stephanie Schaub from uh, 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 Seattle, and she has access to Proton. And it initially, and at least for us, most cases we've put carbon fiber in was for patients who potentially will get Proton uh, 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 after their surgery. Uh, so Stephanie will will discuss about the radiation oncologist perspective regarding proton and carbon fiber. Stephanie, Just make sure my screen is shared. Thank you for having me today. And um, from our from our standpoint too, in Seattle, we our neurosurgeons still have to request and state that they have a high anticipation of using proton therapy to gain access to the carbon fiber implants as well. So um, I'm going to hit on a, a practical perspective of why I think carbon fiber and proton therapy are really the match made in heaven and largely the best indication for using carbon fiber. So this webinar was sponsored by CarboFix. So this is the outline for what I want to cover, and some of this has already been touched upon, so I will kind of dive into some of the distinct details. So some background on X-ray versus proton radiation therapy specifically. So protons have a physical property of no exitose just beyond the area that you want to treat. And that can allow sparing of nearby critical organs at risk that you're treating. That is largely the main reason why, for certain cases, we consider proton therapy. If there's nothing critical near what you want to spare, such as when I treat a sarcoma with an extremity, we wouldn't think of using proton therapy for that specific case. But tumors of the mobile spine and sacrum and um, base of skull are near many critical structures where proton therapy can be helpful. The more advanced proton techniques that we have access to, and most proton centers across um, the US and world are um, using, is pencil beam scanning. And so this is a special type of proton therapy that consists of a pencil beam, or essentially a spot, that delivers a dose at a given depth. And this spot is scanned with magnets that move on voxel by voxel basis. If you think of a voxel on a CT scan as about one millimeter, and it does this on, on one given layer, and then the beam energy is modulated, and then it does it on an additional layer until you cover the entire tumor that you're intending on treating. This more advanced proton um, beam technique, pencil beam scanning, has allowed us, importantly, to have what we call a increased proximal dose conformality. Proton therapy used to have a significant decreased ability to spare things that were in the areas where those proton beams were entering from. So the skin strip, the scar, the wound healing complications, um, we would anticipate could be worse than x-ray-based radiation therapy. And often when treating primary bone tumors, the skin is one of our most critical organs at risk of trying to keep that skin dose largely below 66 gray or a dose at which we hope will keep the risk of either dehiscence or ulceration on the lower end. So the challenge really, and it's been presented many times, but from a practical perspective, titanium hardware forms a particle therapy radiation dose scaffold. It's just, it creates a significant artifact on CT and MR despite the metal artifact reduction technique. And we've come a long way in lower energy magnets for the MRIs. This often results in the need for CT myelograms to delineate the spinal cord. But CT myelograms, as um, Arjun showed us, in certain patients, depending on exactly where those screws are placed, are still sometimes insufficient to fully visualize the spinal cord adequately and does incur an additional invasive procedure that the patient has to undergo. So I wanted to walk you through a practical standpoint so that you can understand exactly what we have to go through when we try to plan proton therapy with titanium and why even something like a tulip with titanium can make us convert despite the advantages of proton therapy to using x-ray based therapy for a given patient. And that is, and really what we're doing is we still have the advanced metal artifact reduction technique software on our CT scanners. 
And this allows us um, to have the most accurate delineation. But when you think of a CT scan that has metal artifact, what is happening? You don't know exactly how big that screw is. So you may not, or that cage or other hardware. So you may be falsely anticipating the actual size itself of the implant that is placed, but using a technique that can help. You essentially have to draw in each different piece of hardware and then do the proper overrides to titanium for those structures. Then you do an additional expansion of three to five millimeters. And then that creates essentially a no-fly zone, meaning I can't put those proton spots that I told you about that I have to use to kind of paint each individual layer of radiation therapy into any area that has the titanium artifacts or within three to five millimeters of that because a patient on any given daily basis could be shifted a little bit. And we have to make sure that while we have a good plan on paper, that it's actually deliverable. And so what does that actually do? If you can't, meaning we still try to use additional proton beams for these patients to help to essentially spread out as much of the low dose as we can. So for a typical spine patient, we usually, um, at least in the thoracic and lumbar and sacrum, we usually treat with two posterior oblique beams. And when there's titanium hardware in place, such as with a screw, you might add in a third beam. You might also try to flare out your beams in a way to try to avoid those screws as much as possible, where you can unanticipatedly get higher kidney, lung, or other dose that you wouldn't want to get with proton therapy anyway. Additional techniques you might try to help to make it work is, again, using those multiple beams and multi-field optimization, which is a special technique where each individual proton beam is optimizing on its own and or jointly together. And um, our center fortunately has access to Monte Carlo dose calculation algorithms within our treatment planning software. And that at least helps give us as much confidence as possible that the dose that we see on paper is most likely the dose that's being delivered in the patient. And so what I wanna highlight here really is I try to just show a few select isodose lines. This is a patient that did not have a carbofix implant but had a different carbon fiber implant and actually and had, had, his, had his titanium hardware replaced at the time of a gross total resection surgery for a carbon fiber implant that was a hybrid implant and still had the titanium screws. So we did pre-op radiation with a titanium hardware implant to 19.8 gray using X-ray-based radiation VMAT um, because of the implant. And then he underwent the surgical um, resection and swap out. And due to the titanium tulips and that no-fly zone, here I just try to turn on a few dose lines. You can see in a post-operative setting, since he already received 20 gray, we were trying to go to a total dose in a post-operative setting of 50 gray to get him to 70 gray total dose between pre and post-op. And here you can see in just the blue line at 29 gray, you can see it's just a complete dose shadowing. This area is receiving very little dose in that area and looking at a composite between this preoperative radiation, even with photons and this, the area was only receiving around 30 to 35 gray when we were treating this with an intention of 70 gray. We did not feel like that was adequate from an oncologic perspective to be able to keep proceeding forward with proton therapy. Um, due for this specific case. Questions came up of, could we have done better tulip positioning? And if they were perhaps maybe further away from where that gross tumor was, but the gross tumor did have a large um, component of soft tissue extension of disease that grew further along the spine, and it, that just wouldn't have been feasible for this specific patient. And so it raises a question with hybrid implants of uncertainty in terms of promise of whether or not proton therapy will be feasible to get the dose that you want to, as well as trying to come up with as good of a proton plan as possible. So from my perspective is, while one can try to attempt and sometimes create reasonable plans with titanium hardware implants on paper, there is still significant concern about dose under coverage target under coverage, tumor control as our primary, and second, 
potentially over or under dosing critical organs at risk. We're taking the spinal cord to higher doses than any other type of tumor we're treating when we treat primary spine tumors. And so it's really important that we're accurate in what we are delivering. And as what was already shown earlier, the P Paul Scherer data showing inferior local control um, with proton therapy, with titanium hardware implants. And so this really does shift our practice into considering more sophisticated X-ray-based radiation therapy approaches, particularly if the implant um, is in locations where you're trying to achieve the high dose. Very select cases, you might consider a window of being able to deliver proton therapy, perhaps for a boost of radiation after delivering more of the low-dose bath um, or the low-risk volume with X-ray-based radiation. But again, those are so select and often you can come up with better radiation plans designing it in one integrated system that usually um, usually we just stick with x-ray-based radiation for those specific patients. Now, what has already been introduced is the carbon fiber peak implant system. And really the important part is that the whole implant is carbon fiber, including the rods and screws in terms of the ability to use proton therapy. It has a density more akin to the human body, and it really enables with much more confidence, our ability to deliver particle-based therapy in a post-operative setting, as well as we've seen how it can be used um, for improved surveillance as well. And this is, again, a summary of three patients that had, these two below had the CarboFix implant system, and this had a hybrid system of a carbon fiber system with, um, with a titanium tulip nuts. And you can just see on the CT and um, the CT that impact on the Hounsfield units that the titanium is making. So what are the strategies that we employ for when we actually plan these patients with carbon fiber? We still use the same metal artifact reduction technique and we still have to draw out and override the hardware that is in place using a specific um, peak density that is within our planning system and kind of fairly widely available. Typically, the ultra-thin titanium coating on the screw itself requires no additional override. And um, Dr. Boriani had already shown us some nice data earlier about the phantom studies that was looking at comparing titanium screws to all carbon fiber to that thin coating, and it was not felt to be clinically meaningful. And it seems to improve user ability for you all, and we want to maximize that. We still typically use multiple beams and multi-field optimization, again, trying to maxim and maximize our ability to confidently deliver dose and minimize any small impact that the titanium or that the carbon fiber hardware may pose. But in general, for proton therapy, we are still limiting our beams typically to two to um, less commonly three, depending on the situation. And this kind of is from my perspective, but resource utilization, again, even in the US, we don't have free access to this technology and we're constantly trying to figure out with our surgical colleagues who best benefits. The type of patients that we tend to think may best benefit are those with primary spine sarcomas or tumors of the mobile spine and sacrum or base of skull that may require dose escalation, especially in their treatment, or that may just live for a long time and need to be followed and likely will be treated with proton beam radiation therapy. Again, additionally, patients with other tumors of the craniospinal axis that may need to undergo surgical resection for some other reason um, and just having that to be able to deliver proton therapy. Now, this is what Dr. Segal had introduced as well, is patients with good prognoses that are planned for SBRT may have improved utilization for the visualization, and really it's the surveillance for those patients. But I do think that the planning can, can often be more straightforward for those patients. The last one to consider is patients with a history of prior radiation therapy in affected area, particularly if we're planning on using proton beam radiation therapy. Although in the metastatic setting, I usually still favor SBRT um, as that can usually deliver the best kind of high dose gradient to best spare the spinal cord in a re-irradiation setting, but it really depends on the target.
So this is my future wish list. And I know everyone has mentioned different things. So I know um, Carbofix is releasing and has released a C-spine hardware implant. I think the future would be to try to have this be a fully carbon fiber implant system to really reliably be able to offer these patient proton therapy. Um, sacral reconstructive implants for these larger sacral surgeries that are happening. Readily available products for implementation and use in the urgent and emergent setting. I think that this can come up often, even for primary bone sarcomas, um, and this can help to eliminate the need for an additional and unnecessary surgery just to swap out hardware. Um, and solutions potentially for skeletally immature patients. So thank you, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to engage with you all tonight.